First, let's go over the basics. My name is Calvin Neufeld. I have a beautiful wife, Sharon. I have two even more beautiful little girls, both of them pugs. Heidi is white and Beatrice is black. And I have a handsome man, Gérard Mon Beau Petit Chat. He's French. I am a female to male transsexual. And yes, from time to time, I pick my nose. <laughs> but you know what they say, I was born this way. And it's true. I was born bald. <laughs> but that's hard for me to talk about. So let's move on to something a little lighter. You'll notice, if you can see past the glare, that I was also born a girl. And that's where my story begins. I started out a bald baby girl, and you can see that I took a little liberty in my recreation of the event. I was named Caitlin Joanna, which means pure and God is gracious. Now, I'm grateful to my parents for the names that they chose for me. Though I tell you it's hard to live up to a name like pure, <laughs> gee whiz. I'm glad to hear God is gracious. <laughs> of course, I've since renamed myself, and I aimed at a much more realistic target. I chose the name Calvin, which means little bald one. <laughs> it's true. There's a name I can live up to. I already have. More importantly, it's the name of my lifelong favorite comic strip character. My second name is now Jacob, which means usurper. I thought it fitting, considering. And it's my grandfather's name. When I told my dad this, it was funny. His reaction was, so he's going to have a granddaughter named after him. <laughs> Won't he be proud? <laughs> but of course, my grandfather loves me. And I'm sure that when he hears this, he will be proud that he has that connection now with his grandson. I was also born a Christian, or more specifically a Mennonite, which is both a cultural identity and a conservative religious tradition defined by simple living, hard work, community, faith, and fierce pacifism. Usually in Mennonite upbringing, you would find fairly rigid male-female gender roles and boundaries. For example, I was raised in a church where many women covered their heads and where women weren't permitted to speak or to have authority over men in a religious sense. So I suppose I was exceptionally fortunate that my family wasn't overtly concerned with gender roles and boundaries. Even though my mother was a housewife and my father led all the prayers and other such traditional stuff, my parents were free thinkers and raised me to be the same. My mother, for example, believed that a woman has the right and the freedom to dress and act according to her preference. So, I was free to choose my own clothes from the hand-me-down bags, which always felt like Christmas, by the way. And, of course, according to my preference, I dressed and acted more or less like a boy. And my mother just took it as one of the many ways in which a female is free to express herself, which, of course, it is. My father was also not a slave to tradition. If his daughter wanted to play baseball, for example, he'd make sure she kicks butt. But he did draw the line at females burping and farting, which I always thought was offensive to the extreme. He farts, I fart, he burps, I burp, but he wouldn't listen to logic. <laughs> so as I grew up, I may have been denied the male privilege of passing gas. I like to think I'm making up for it now. But I was granted the freedom to play with the boys and dress how I wanted, except for my awful school uniform, the skirt and blouse and tights and all that. And I could play baseball on all-boy teams and kick butt if I do say so myself. I eventually earned the nickname Killer, though I can't imagine where they got that from. I think serious injury is the worst they could have accused me of. There was only one problem. In my head, I knew I was a girl, but I didn't feel like one. I knew that the normal thing would be for me to play with the girls, but I didn't get the girls, and the girls didn't get me. If we played house, I was assigned to be the husband and was given the attic room in the tree where I was told to stay, <laughs> which I was happy to do so long as I didn't have to play mom and baby and housewife and plan marriages and stuff like that. I didn't even know what to do with Barbies and dolls other than tying them up and popping their limbs off. So mostly I played G.I. Joe and Ninja Turtles with the boys like any sensible person. I call this stage of my life oblivious. I remained oblivious throughout my childhood until one day, one bloody day, to use a double entendre, pardon my French, 
some trigger went off in my body and I started turning into a girl of all things. And my friends started turning into boys who like girls. And that's when things started getting really complicated. The day my best friend told me I was a beautiful princess, I knew that the good old days were gone. This was a whole new ball game. This was puberty. And with puberty, I had to accept that this body of mine was determined to turn into, fem into a female one. And in my oblivion, I figured I had no choice but to make a go of being a girl. The result, of course, was more or less ridiculous as depicted in this carefully crafted dramatization. I had no natural instinct for it. I call this stage of my life clueless. I had no idea that there was an alternative to living as a female imposter, as it felt to me. And I had no idea how to pull it off right. Basically, I had no idea about anything. I was raised Mennonite, remember? My whole life was church, Bible study, youth group, church, and private Christian school. And they didn't exactly teach sexual and gender diversity anywhere in those little bubbles. My school didn't provide sex education, and I had skipped the grade where they teach biology, and I didn't have internet, that's how old I am. So you can imagine how much I knew about bodies, sex, what's down there, and naughty stuff like that. Puberty. Stuff started growing in all the wrong places, two in particular in front. Bras were eventually forced on me when my natural look evolved into inappropriate. I think I wore the same one bra for 10 years, about equivalent to its natural lifespan from purchase to total erosion off my body because there was no way you were getting me into a store to buy another. Puberty felt all wrong and completely unnatural. But however much it appalled me to be suddenly bleeding once a month for five days for crying out loud and growing a bubble butt and an hourglass figure, I thought my only option was to try to make it work and go with the flow, so to speak. At first, I figured that these feelings would pass, that this must be the experience of all women. So for a while, the worst damage my little dilemma caused was embarrassment for me and an eyesore for everyone else. But the feelings didn't go away. They grew stronger with time and with the experience of acting like someone I wasn't, which felt to me an awful lot like lying. By no fault of my own, I had become a liar to myself and to others. I was faking everything, every smile, every laugh, every gesture, every girly giggle or whatever it is that girls do in a girly way. Hiding from myself and from others erased me, and the damage that this caused was much more serious. Being a girl on the outside and feeling like a boy on the inside made me confused, sad, angry, and sick. I call this stage of my life unhappy. For years, I couldn't eat. And for years later, when I started eating again, I would throw it back up. I hated everything about me, my voice, my hair, my hips, my boobs. And since I hated my body, I hated myself. And since I hated myself, I hated everyone else. And since I hated everyone and everything, I hated life. All of that hate, turned into violence, and instead of letting it out, I turned it inward, throwing myself on my own grenade of rage. I grew very thin from the starving and puking, and very scarred inside and out. I wanted to cause as much damage as possible to a body that felt like an enemy to me. I isolated myself from family and friends, but put on a good show when it counted so that I would get what I wanted which was to be left alone to kill myself or die trying. I'm telling you this because I think it's important that we speak honestly about these things. Suicide is all too real, and the cost of silence is all too high. By the time I was in university, I was a shell of a person floating through life under a very dark storm cloud. Most days I stayed home and slept and starved and hurt myself. But some days, I dragged myself to class where I spent my time fantasizing about curling up on the floor and falling asleep. Nothing had the power to awaken in me the will to life until one day, as I sat perched on my pedestal of personal suffering, something changed. A face stood out of the crowd. <laughs> A few years later, I married her. This, of course, is Sharon. She who must be named because she's just so wonderful. 
Sharon was something completely different, and she woke me up. Sharon loved me just the way I was, though she thought I looked funny and didn't hesitate to say so. It's a good thing, as she reminds me often, that she likes weird things. It was love at first sight, and from that point on, we were a bird and a fish making a home together. Sharon has been bringing me to my senses ever since. I call this stage of my life happier. From our first conversation, Sharon had this funny notion that happiness is the most important thing. Sacrilege, I thought. Selfishness. How could I justify putting my own happiness first? Sharon, of course, thought I was foolish to disagree. Foolish to have put my happiness last on my list of priorities. It's taken me eight years and counting to figure out why she's been right all along. When I was unhappy, nothing mattered to me, not even my own life. Happiness is restoring my life just as unhappiness sucked it out of me. It amazes me how long it took for me to figure out the totally obvious, which is that happiness leads to quality of life and that unhappiness leads to the opposite. Happiness is the most important thing because it makes everything, everything better. And because without it, all good things in life seem pointless. Before I met Sharon, I was obsessed with being the person that I thought my friends and family and God and in fact my own biology expected of me. And I was doing a terrible job of it and I was miserable every step of the way. Falling in love with Sharon changed my course radically in the direction of happiness, truth, and love. Hokey as it sounds, think about it. For the first time, I could love and be loved freely. I could be truthful about myself without feeling fear or shame. I could enjoy life without feeling selfish. I could enjoy being alive. These are the things I'd been denying myself all those years of trying to be good and getting it all wrong. I should never have been so foolish as to think that I was better off with lies and pretending than I was with truth. It sounds so obvious that it shouldn't need to be said, but it only became obvious to me after meeting Sharon that truth and love and happiness are the best priorities and the obvious choice for anyone who wants quality of life. A lot has changed in the eight years that Sharon and I have loved each other. After all, when we met, I was female and Christian and closeted, and Sharon was female and agnostic and had only dated guys, and I picked my nose and she thought that was gross. Basically, we couldn't have been more different. If our life were a movie, I don't know whether it would be a romantic comedy or a psychological thriller. Either way, it would have plenty of twists and turns. The changes were gradual, beginning with the most urgent matter of socks and sandals, which is an offense that Sharon does not tolerate. <laughs> that was the first thing to go, and the only change imposed by Sharon, because even her love isn't boundless, it stops at socks and sandals. So I corrected that, and all was right in Sharon's world again. And in the years to follow, I started making some wardrobe changes of my own, because for the first time in a long time, it seemed possible for all to be right in my world, too. It started with the little things. Actually, it started with me whining. Sharing your whining self in a relationship occurs at about the same stage that a person resumes passing gas. This is after an agonizing honeymoon stage of making good impressions and holding that stuff inside. So eventually, I started letting it out around Sharon. I started whining, for example, about how much I hated shaving my legs, how much I didn't want to do it. Then don't do it, she said. It was a revelation to me. I stopped shaving. Then I started whining about how much I hated my hair and having to figure out what to do with it every morning, how much I just wanted to shave it all off. Then shave it off, she said. It was another revelation. Immediately I got her to chop it all off and she was happy to comply. Sharon likes playing with scissors and she loves a makeover. And then I started whining about how much I hated getting dressed every morning, how I felt physically sick putting on women's clothes day after day. So Sharon took me shopping. She loves shopping too and didn't interfere as I picked out the clothes that I wanted, men's clothes. Of course, she interferes in my wardrobe plenty now, but not so much with what clothes I buy as what clothes I wear out of the house. I still don't see what's wrong with overalls. 
With every step along the way, I was becoming more and more truthful and more and more comfortable in the body that I've got to work with and more and more happy. It was incredibly difficult to do. My fears ranged from what if everyone rejects me to what if I'm completely insane? And it meant turning my world upside down. But it was upside down from lifeless. So I judged the tree by its fruit, as the Bible would say, and transitioning felt awfully fruity to me. That's a joke, of course. What I mean to say is, living in my body before felt rotten. Living in my body now feels delicious. It's obvious which fruit comes from a healthier tree. There have been so many changes over the years. When Sharon and I fell in love, I had to first come out technically as a lesbian, though I never felt that word applied to me. I would just tell people that Sharon and I are so happy together. A few years later, we got married when it became legal for us to do so, and that whole thing came with complications of its own. I mean, a wedding is bad enough as it is, but many people we loved weren't there to share it with us, just as many people that we love aren't here today. And then, just two weeks after the wedding, actually, I came out finally as a transsexual. Let's hope it's finally. I think my parents will be glad if they never hear we need to sit and talk ever again. <laughs> And then there were the surgeries and the hormones and all kinds of exciting stuff like that, but I won't go into that now because the film we're about to watch tells that part of my story. Not all of the changes, of course, were for the better. We all lost friends, family, and churches. There's been so much loss. Few friends have proved faithful, and I think we've all learned a lesson or two in loneliness. But... As my mom said, we're building something wonderful. And she's exactly right. And that's what I call this stage of my life, rebuilding. And I figure from here, starting tomorrow actually, the next and last stage of my life will be old fart. And I'm pretty sure that stage can last indefinitely. I am what I am. I spent most of my life fighting who I was refusing to accept myself and trying to be someone else, and the results were disastrous. But with a little bit of love, a little bit of happiness, and a little bit of truth, I've discovered that anyone, even me and even you, can take whatever crap cards you're dealt and make a good play of it. Do the best you can with what you've got to work with. You don't have to be trans for this to apply to you. Accept what is and make it as good as it can be. Please don't waste time suffering needlessly. Don't settle for an unhappy existence. Make happiness your priority and fight for it. Defend it. Preserve it. Because your happy self is your best self. And since both happiness and unhappiness are highly contagious. Think carefully about which germs you're spreading. Life really is good. It's all there is in the end. Without life, there's nothing. If there's someone here who is so foolish as to think that the world is better off without you, or that you're better off dead than admitting the truth about something, remember that those who love you want you any way that is alive. Never forget that, as I did. The world has never been better off by suicide. Let's get real. Let's all be sensible and make the obvious choice. Choose life and quality of life. The happier each of us is, the better off we all are. Life is good, but it can be better. Better and better and better. I think that everyone here will discover at some point that life doesn't always go the way you planned. And there will be times when you might not feel like life is such a sweet deal. So fight. Do whatever it takes. Be ruthless in your pursuit of quality of life for you and everyone else. And please, be smarter than I was. And don't forget that you can't have quality of life without truth, love, and happiness.